So thank you very much um, for inviting me to speak. And um, can you all hear me? And thank you very much for involving me in this investigation, which has been fantastic. Um, I wanted just a few things to say before I start. Um, can I ask you please not to take photographs or film um, until we get to the uh, part on uh, Richard himself, because there are some images that I'm going to show that are um, of human remains and also some of donated um, body. So um, until we get past that, um, I'll ask you not to use your cameras at all. Uh, and with that goes a warning that I'm going to be showing you some human remains. So if you don't want to see that, then <laughs> I can call you back in afterwards if you like. Um, nothing. I'm not going to show you anything really hideous, don't worry, just that there will be uh, human remains involved. <clears throat> and, um, and also I wanted to say that, as with all of these things, this is... Um, a team effort. So there are many people that are involved in the, in the research group that I run at the university. And um, Dr. Chris Rin helped me with the translation of the CT data in, and putting the school together. And Janice Aitken, who's here at the front, uh, was involved in the texturing of the physical head and also of the digital head. So we'll try and show you everything that's been involved in the analysis. But I wanted to give you a little bit of context uh, to this kind of work because I'm aware from following the programme and also through the other work that we've done in the past um, that some of the first responses to the work that we've done here has been, oh, they just made it look like the portrait. <laughs> or oh, they just made it up as they go along. So I'm going to attempt, hopefully, to give you uh, some of the science behind the work that we do so that you can see why we've reached the decisions that we have in terms of his facial appearance. So, um, most of the work that we're involved in now um, is using digital technology, so computerised technology. Traditionally, this kind of work came from clay reconstructions, um, physical heads and uh, two-dimensional work, but we now have uh, fantastic computer equipment that allows us to be able to carry out most of this work in a digital format. And the benefit of that is that it's almost entirely non-invasive. So I didn't see or handle any of these remains at all. Um, I haven't been even near them. Everything has been sent to me in Scotland and we did the work there without seeing any of the human remains at all. Um, I've seen photographs of the skull and of the, the remains as they were found in scene, but everything else was done from the clinical imaging that was taken of, of the, specifically for me, uh, of the skull. But as you can see, we've been involved uh, in a number of other historical figures. This was uh, some work we did a few years ago on Johann Sebastian Bach, the, the famous composer. So we've, we've worked a lot with historical figures uh, not necessarily in the same way as we have with this particular case, though. Um, in terms of the research that um, is behind the work that we do, uh, traditionally that has come from anatomy and anthropology. So through human dissection, uh, we've, we've discovered the relationships between the skeletal structure and the muscle structure and the muscle structure and the facial appearance. And through measuring and feeling faces, we've, we've been able to develop some anatomical standards also based on that dissection within an anatomy department. Uh, but with the development of clinical imaging and access to clin clinical imaging, we can also look at the relationships between the hard and the soft tissues by looking at CT data and MR data and craniographs and sometimes ultrasound images as well. So a lot of the data that we use now, especially that have been developed over the last 10 years, is really based on living people and clinical images rather than on dissection of dead people, which is where traditionally this work first started. Uh, our computer system is is a fantastic thing all in itself. I wish I could bring it to show you all now personally because describing it is almost impossible to do. It's a three-dimensional system. So we can take a three-dimensional model of a skull into the computer system. And then we have this uh, haptic arm that you can see there in the top uh, right image. And that gives you haptic feedback, 
which effectively means that I can feel what I'm touching on the computer screen. How fantastic is that? <laughs> so what I can do is I can do the same sculpture and the same modelling that I can do with real clay, but I can do it in a computer system. It's not entirely like working with clay in your hands, um, because you're working with one tool rather than all your fingers, but it does give you that intuitive sense that you have, and you can feel details on the skull in the same way as you do when you're sculpting in real clay. And what that's enabled us to do is to set up this 3D, 3D system so that we have a database of pre-modelled muscles and we import those muscles for each individual skull and then alter them to fit each skull. And then we follow anatomical standards for taking measurements of facial features and uh, predicting the soft tissues and we can model that directly onto the muscle structure and then put a skin layer over and above that. So the system that we use is very much based on sets of contemporary data from contemporary individuals. So we don't have medieval data that we can use for Richard III. We have to use contemporary data um, instead. But we're, we're working on the assumption that we haven't changed that much anatomically um, although we may have changed in the amount of fat we carry, but I'll come back to that um, at another time. Uh, so we work, for, as you can see, from CT data, laser scan data, so that we can laser scan a skull um, that's in front of us and take that data in as well. And the more data we have from an individual skull, the, the better we can produce a facial depiction. So you can see the two, the two systems in traditional clay and digital clay, following the same process, this slow build-up of the anatomical structures onto the skull directly, and then uh, a tissue layer of uh, subcutaneous fat and skin that's placed over and above <coughs> that muscle structure to give the finished face. And these are just a few um, cases that I want to show you that we've done some work on in the past. So these are other famous historical figures. We've got uh, Robert Burns at the bottom there. We did a reconstruction of him recently. Um, uh, Ramesses II at the bottom is the famous uh, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, we've got St. Nicholas at the top left um, from remains from Bari Cathedral in Italy. Uh, we've got uh, Cleopatra's sister in the middle there, Arsinoe, her name was, and then a, a knight from Stirling Castle at the top, um, top right there. Just to give you some idea of the, the previous work that we've done, so you can see um, some of our background and why we may have been approached to get involved in this work in the first place. So... Then the most frequently asked question to me, as I've, I've just demonstrated earlier, apart from, I have to say, uh, is, is that Philippa woman as crazy as she seems on television? That's the second <laughs> most. <laughs> apart from that, <laughs> to which the answer was no, of course not. Um, otherwise, the most frequently asked question is about accuracy. So how do we know that the face that we're depicting looks anything like the individual did in life? And obviously one of the ways that we can look at that is through carrying out our own tests. And I thought you would appreciate seeing these, or some of the results of these, before we talk about the uh, craniofacial analysis of Richard III. So these are a few of our blind studies done in the computer. So we have uh, human remains, um, in this case from laser scan data, taken into the computer, reconstruction produced without knowing the individual identity, and then we can compare them directly with the faces of the individuals. And this is done from known remains with anti-mortem images or sometimes from living people. So it's now possible to take CT data, to take you, take you into a hospital, CT scan you, for me to get a copy of your skull, to reconstruct your face and then compare it directly with your face whilst you're alive, which is another thing that we've been doing as well. So here's a few people who've who have um, volunteered for this uh, subjection. <laughs> so we have, and this is the work of one of my PhD students, uh, Won Jun Lee, 
And he worked with some individuals from Korea, took their CT data. They were in Korea. He was in Scotland, didn't know what they looked like, produced the reconstructions, and then compared it directly with their faces. So you can make a judgment for yourself in terms of how accurate you think shape is. Um, but one of the things we've been able to do, because um, with CT data you get the physical face as well as the skull of the individual that's scanned, one of the things that we can do is we can take the skulls of the reconstruction inside the reconstruction and the skull inside the face of the living person, superimpose them and then compare the surface of the reconstruction with the surface of the face. So we can see metrically where the differences and similarities are between the surface of the reconstruction and the surface of the face. And what this is doing is it's showing you a contour map for the differences. So we've got the reconstruction at the bottom the actual face of the individual above it, and this picture that's coloured on the side is the contour map of differences. So anything that's blue is pretty good accuracy. Um, where we're going into green and yellow, we're getting uh, more difference between the reconstruction and the uh, face, and the red areas are the areas of most inaccuracy. And what we've got here is the injury that this person had, which is why they had a CT scan. Um, and some of this is to do with the person lying down in the CT scanner. But what we find from the results is that about 70% of the surface of the face of the reconstruction has less than two millimetres of error. So we know exactly how accurate we are at reconstructing the physical shape of an individual face from the skull. The problem for us, so we know how accurate we are here in terms of shape, the problem for us is the rest of it. Uh, putting textures onto the physical shape is the bit that we don't know. We don't know from someone's remains what colour skin they had, what colour eyes they had, what colour their hair was, how they wore their hair, how long it was, what type of hair they had, how many wrinkles they had, how much fat they were carrying. We don't know any of this from human remains at all. So everything we do from this stage onwards is really guessing except it may be an educated guess based on information, but it really is guessing. Um, for us, in terms of the reconstructions we do in the computer, it's possible to add quite complicated uh, textures around and wrap them around the three-dimensional head and produce quite realistic images of what the person may have looked like. But what we want to do, uh, in most cases, is to get that as accurate as possible. And most of the work that I do is within the forensic field. So most of the work that I'm involved in is helping the police identify bodies that are unidentified. So what we want in that scenario is to put information out that will help the person be identified. Uh, and if we put the wrong information out, then that could lead to confusion and the person may not be identified. So this is the same person he actually looks like neither of these images. His name is Dr. Bromby. He's an academic from Scotland. Uh, he got a makeup artist to give him different looks, uh, different hairstyles, wigs, facial hair wigs, glasses, etc. Exactly the same face. There's no prosthetics involved here at all. So the shape of his face is exactly the same. But if you knew him as he looked here, and the reconstruction went out like this, then you may not recognise him because just those difference in textures can have a massive effect on how we recognise individual faces. So when we're involved in forensic cases, we, we don't put information on that we don't know for certain because if we guess and we get it wrong, then the person may not be recognised. But what we also know is that if we don't put textures on at all, then we also get a lowering of recognition. So does anybody know who this is? It's me. So this is a laser scan. I showed this to someone the other week and they said, David Beckham. <laughs> uh, and somebody in the past has also said, President Obama. I'm slightly offended by that. Anyway, this is a laser scan of my face. My daughter, who at the time was 12 years of age, didn't recognise me from this image which just goes to tell you how important those textures are in recognition and how much that affects our facial appearance. So when we're dealing with something like an archaeological case or a historical investigation, we might need extra help 
from text and from other information, portrait information, to get a depiction that looks like the individual. Um, other problems that we have in this type of work are representations of age. So we, we know how faces age. Uh, we know what happens to the face as you get older. We know that you get wrinkles, you get sagging of flesh, you get loss of subcutaneous fat, you have hair changes, it's incredibly depressing. Uh, the effects of gravity and all the issues that we have with what happens as our face gets older, we understand them. There are physiological reasons for why this happens. The problem is that we don't know when it happens. And people age very differently. So on these, both these rows, these people are within 10 years of each other in terms of age. And yet some of them, and I won't name names, have aged better than others. And that will be related to lifestyle, to genetics. If your parents age well, then you probably age well too. To ethnic group, there are certain ethnic groups that age better than others to whether you sleep on your back or your front. If you sleep on your front, by the way, you get more wrinkles than if you sleep on your back. Uh, how much weight you're carrying, all of these, how much sun damage you have, all of these issues will have an effect on, on how quickly your, your face shows age. And when we do a reconstruction, say of a 50-year-old, we don't know whether it's a 50-year-old who looks like a 70-year-old or a 50-year-old who looks like a 30-year-old or a 50-year-old who looks like a 50-year-old. So it's difficult for us to add this age-related changes to the face because, again, we're guessing. So it's probably fair to say that a facial reconstruction of a young adult will be more accurate than a facial reconstruction of someone in advanced years because all of those age-related changes we are guessing. And we may have to do that in order to represent their age, but we are also we have to be cautious about what we add in terms of age related changes the other thing that we don't know that i've mentioned is how much fat someone is carrying from a, a forensic point of view we work on the average always so we use average tissue depth data and we use anatomical standards that are based on multiple people in populations that are averaged out so we always work from averages and we work on the assumption that if you know somebody then, you would still recognise them if they'd gained a couple of stone or lost a couple of stone. But of course we have no idea in most cases whether somebody is a little heavier or a little slighter. We may, in archaeological cases, take into account the period of time in which they lived. So with Richard III, we were using data that we, we assumed would be closer to a medieval size diet than to a contemporary close to obesity type diet that we have now. So we, you do have to make judgment calls on the data that you use within archaeological cases. So to Richard, eventually. Um, this, is the, this is the basically the data that I worked from. So um, good quality photographs that were taken of the skull um, in fragments and after it had been uh, reassembled, and the CT data that was taken uh, at the Leicester Royal Infirmary. Um, we worked from, for the reconstruction, because of the time restra restraints, we actually did most of the work from the CT <coughs> data that was carried out on the skull when it was uncleaned. So the skull had a lot of soil sticking to it, and, and it was CT scanned before most of the soil was taken off, and then it was scanned again. So we worked in the reconstruction in the computer from the data with some of the soil. But we did get the micro CT data followed on shortly and to refer to during the process. It's just from a time scale point of view, we had to start work on it. Um, so the data that you see uh, in the reconstruction, the school will look a little bit more bob knobbly and bobbly than, than in the CT data, because that's little bits of soil that are sticking to the outside. So from kind of general assessment of the skull, um, it's very definitely male. Um, there are a lot of, of strong male characteristics to it in that it's got a, a wide palate, a U-shaped palate. It's got a square jaw, a prominent chin. It's got mild brow ridges. They're not huge. The brow ridge is this area of bone um, where the eyebrows sit. And in male faces, you get a bulge there. And in female faces, you, you have a smooth brow. 
and that is stronger. The more, more characteristically male a face is, the stronger those characteristics will be. Um, it, this, I mean, I know the remains have been described as gracile, and I would say the same of the skull, um, but, it, but that's not to dispute that it, it, that it looks male. It very definitely look male, looks male. It's just at the gracile end of a male scale. So what we're not looking at is the skull of Wayne Rooney, which I would expect to be heavily masculine with a big square jaw and a heavy brow and um, very definite male characteristics. We're looking at a skull of a man with more delicate features than you would expect of, of a heavy-duty boxer or whatever. Um, it's also very definitely of Caucasoid origin, so of, of appropriate for a white European population in that it's got a very upright profile and that we've got the same nasal characteristics to the aperture that we would expect for this population. Um, the, the skull as it was scanned was a little bit, um, it had been fragmented and moved, so the, the bones weren't in the, in the right position when we received them, so we had to separate the bones off in our computer system and then reassemble them in, in the correct position. Um, so you can see the fragments here as they were reassembled and the missing, the tooth that had been removed had to be remodelled as well as a mirror of the one that was already there for the reconstruction purposes. And then the process um, follows the same process that you've seen in some of the previous slides. Uh, the first thing that we do is to add eyeballs into the orbits. I'll come back to eyes in a minute to tell you the details of how we do that. And then these pegs are added to the surface of the skull. So these pegs represent the average tissue depths at those anatomical points for someone of the same ethnic group, gender and age. So what we're using here are male measurements from a white European population between the age of 30 and 40 years of age. Now, these are contemporary data. So this is taken from a 1980s population uh, in Europe, um, which is not wholly appropriate for someone from a medieval period of time. So what we did was we used the lower end of the range um, for the reconstruction of Richard III on the basis that his diet would be um, different from the diet we had now. But this is the only data we have. As I said, we don't have medieval data, and we have to use some data. So this is the data that we've used. And then the, the muscles from our database were imported and modelled to fit uh, the new skull. And then what we do is we, have, we also have a database of facial features that we can import and then alter. We choose one from the database that we think is the closest to the type of feature that we want on the skull. We bring it in and then we alter that to match up to the measurements and the um, formulae that we've gone through to um, find out what the shape of that particular feature would be in the first place. And I'll come back to those two. So at the risk of boring you, <laughs> I'm going to tell you every decision that we made in terms of this face. Um, and I feel like I, that I need to do this because uh, when, we, when we were given this case to work on, I didn't know if this was going to be Richard III or not. The DNA results didn't come in until the day before the television programme went out. And I would be stupid to have just done a reconstruction looking at the portrait because then it could have ended up being some car park attendant who died in 1992 <laughs> and I would look like an idiot. <laughs> so, <laughs> unlikely, I know. Um, so, uh, what I did was I followed all of the anatomical process so that I could justify to you every decision that we made in terms of the face. So in terms of our anatomical structures, in, in terms of the eyes, we have anatomical standards that were developed in the, in the 1900s from human dissection. We know what the average uh, eyeball diameter is, and that's what we use. So the average eyeball diameter is 24 millimetres for an adult, and that's, that's the size that we use. We also have average data for the position of the eyeball within the socket. And the basic rule is that it sits closer to the roof and the lateral wall, the outer wall of the orbit. So we can position it based on these, this average data. Um, in terms of eyeball structure, with the anatomical structures around the eyes, 
are there for functional reasons. So we know that the, um, the inner corner of the eye is positioned near the anterior lacrimal crest, which is a little hollow in the inside of the orbit, where the lacrimal apparatus sits that allows tears to drain into the eye. So that's where the inner corner of the eye has to sit. We also know that the outer corner of the eye is attached to something called the Mailer tubicle, or Whitnell's tubicle is the other name, which is a little bump on the outside corner of the orbit where that attaches, and a little piece of bone, uh, a little lump of bone sits there so that it can attach onto that point. So if we follow these anatomical points and model the eye and position the eyeball and, and have the eyelid wrapping around the eyeball, then you can't go wrong, really, in terms of anatomy if you follow these structures. In terms of the prominence of the eyeball in the socket, we have average data that relates to uh, a tangent touching the uh, midpoint uh, above and below the orbit, touching the iris of the eyeball. That's the average eyeball protrusion. And with uh, Richard III's eyes, he didn't have particularly deep or shallow sockets, so that would suggest this normal protrusion. So you can see with, with his particular skull, we used average data for the eyeballs and the position of the eye. Um, if we look at the position of the anterior lacrimal crest and the malar tubicle, he has horizontal eye fissures. And we went with that, and the eyeball was positioned in depth in relation to his normal depth of, of orbit. Um, other standards that we follow relate to the shape of the eyeballs following, uh, shape of the eyelids following the, the eyeball shape, and that the anatomically the outer corner of the eye, um, the angle is more acute than the inner corner of the eye, and that we have this lacrimal caruncle, which is that fleshy lump you have on the inner corner of your eye where the tear duct sits. We have to model that in. And we can look at the brow. These are standards developed in Russia that relate the shape of the brow and the shape of the upper orbital margin to the shape of the eyebrows. So when we look at uh, Richard III's skull, we can see that his brow suggests that he has a low, straight eyebrow shape and that his eyelid fold is positioned centrally above the eye. So these are the standards that we work to. In terms of the nose, traditionally, the nose has always been one of the most difficult areas to predict from the skull because it's mostly cartilage. So your bone stops about here, and this bit is mostly cartilage, and, and you don't find that with the remains. So it's always been quite difficult to predict nasal shape. However, in the last few years, with clinical imaging, we've actually got really good standards for developed through looking at living individuals and tested multiple times. We're actually really good at doing noses now. So I would say, put my neck on the line, noses are our best feature now. <laughs> okay? And the standards that we do is we can take those uh, here, these three measurements from the bony aperture, and there, there are six regression formula we put them through, and it gives us these six measurements of the soft nose. We also take tangents from the bone at the top of the nose and the nasal spine to tell us how far the nose projects. Uh, we can look at the position of the what's called the crista conchalis, which is inside of the nasal aperture, tells you where the upper border of the outer shape of the nostril sits. And if you look at the bony aperture in profile, it kind of mirrors, in some respects, the shape of the profile of the nose. So if you have a very pointed aperture, you'll have a very pointed nose. If it's very rounded, that goes with a rounded nose, etc. And it, from the front, if we measure, measure the nasal aperture at its widest point, then that will be three-fifths of the overall width of the nose. So, and that's regardless of ethnic group. It's been tested many times and works exceptionally well. And this is the height of the Christa Conchalis here, telling us the height of this fleshy part of the ailey. So we've got quite a lot of information about the nose. And when we look at Richard III's nose, what we, you can see here, if you can just see those lines... These are the tangents we take for projection, and these are the measurement lines that we take for um, those measurements on the soft nose, and the width of the nose and the height of the ailey were taken from those uh, points on the skull. When we look at the nasal spine, we can see that his, the base of his nose here was horizontal, that he didn't have an upturned or a downturned nose. Uh, that The dorsal ridge, which is the shape in profile, is very slightly convex, and with a little indentation just before the tip, um, uh, but the, the tip is quite sharp, relatively speaking. 
Um, so he's got quite a good nose, <laughs> nice and prominent, nice and characteristic, um, and, and we can get all this information from uh, looking at the nasal aperture. In terms of the mouth, as any dentist will tell you, your teeth are directly related to your lips. And we can tell where the corners of the mouth sit by looking at the position of the canine teeth. So the, the corners of your mouth sit on radiating lines from the outer borders of the canine teeth. And your, for most of us, the fissure of the mouth will sit halfway up the, central, the upper incisors. Um, if we haven't got teeth, then we can use the infraorbital foramina, which are little holes below the orbits that also sit directly above the corners of the mouth. Uh, how your teeth meet will determine how your lips meet. So if your upper teeth project more than your lower teeth, then your upper lip will project more than your lower lip and vice versa. And different bites will give different lip shapes. Um, and complicated dental patterns will give what's called incompetent lip patterns, which means that people have difficulty closing their mouth. Um, in general, it's easier for us to do a reconstruction with the mouth closed because they look a little bit weird if you leave them with the mouth open. Uh, but sometimes we have to do that because of the dental pattern, but not in this case. And then we can relate the height of the enamel part of the teeth with um, the, the thickness of the lips. And the width of the philtrum, the philtrum is that groove underneath the nose at the top of the lip. The, the width of that is related to the width, the distance between the central incisors. So when we look at Richard, we can see that the, the corners of his mouth are slightly downturned. We can see where they're positioned because of his canine teeth. We can see that he has what's described as edge-to-edge -edge occlusion of his incisors, which means that his lower lip would be slightly more prominent than his upper lip. I've got edge-to-edge -edge occlusion. When you catch me not talking, you can see that my lower <laughs> lip is slightly more prominent than my upper lip because of that. Um, and his teeth suggest that he had quite thin lips. The pr one of the problem areas we have with reconstruction is getting the exact shape of the vermilion, the red part of the lip. That's difficult to get right. We don't have good standards for that yet. But we do know that his lips were quite thin and that he had quite a wide philtrum. So the distance between the central points of his uh, maxillary incisors is quite, are quite wide. Um, we can look at the shape of the chin and the jaw to tell us about that overall lower proportions of the face. And that kind of comes automatically with the muscle structure. And there are no real standards for this. It's just the skull kind of automatically gives you this. And we can see from um, these remains that he has a very prominent chin, very noticeably prominent, pushes out actually a little bit further than, than his mouth. Uh, but he's got quite a square jawline that's also associated with him being a, a strong male as well. Oh, ears are our, one of our problem areas. <laughs> we can see whether somebody has earlobes or not from looking at what's called the mastoid process which is on the base of the skull so you either most of us have earlobes which means that our ears go up before they hit the side of the face but about 10 percent of the population have what's called adherent ears which means that the ear doesn't go up it just hits the side of the head like you can see in this image here so probably hands up who's got adherent ears there we go, a nice 10% of the room there. And that's a, that's a hereditary feature. Um, so if you've got adherent ears, then one of your parents will have adherent ears too. Most of the time, they go together. So if you've got one, a lobe on one side, you'll have a lobe on the other. But sometimes it's different. And this is the same person on here. He has one lobe and one adherent ear. And actually, my daughter does too. My daughter has one lobe and one adherent ear as well. Um, so it doesn't always go, but in general we can tell whether someone has an earlobe or not. And there's some indication of prominence in relation to what's called the supramastoid crest, which is a, a bony line above the mastoid process. tells you whether someone has prominent ears or not. That's pretty much all we know about ears. We don't really know size, um, certainly not shape. In forensic cases, we work on the assumption that most of us ears are not that important for recognition. Maybe Prince Charles could be important. 
But for most of us, the size and shape of our ears is not significant in recognition. But obviously, in terms of archaeology, we like to get it as accurately as possible. So what we tend to do is we have standard ears that we, we have um, lobes or not that we can add on to the reconstruction. Uh, in relation to Richard the third, he had quite l large ears in, because the general rule is that the size of your ears are roughly related to the size of your nose. Um, he has lobes. And uh, the supramastoid crest suggests that there were, his ears were slightly prominent. So that's all we had to go on for his ears. In terms of the neck, um, the neck is positioned in relation to those uh, mastoid processes. So the mastoid process is where this muscle, which is called sternocleidomastoid, sits. And it attaches onto that mastoid process on the base of the skull. So the width of your neck will be directly related to the width between those mastoid processes because that's where that muscle sits. So we can position the width of his neck based on that shape. And in this case, we had that um, shoulder disparity in terms of height that was related to the scoliosis. Um, but otherwise, we have a scanned database of necks that we import uh, to fit. So, with all that information, we can model the muscle structure, we can define some of the facial features, and then we can use that tissue depth data as well to create the finished face. When you look at those two images at the bottom, you can see very clearly the relationship between the skull and the overall facial appearance. So that what we end up with in the computer with the reconstruction is this kind of um, shape-based head and neck. So there's no colour here. This is just the colour that we choose to do with the clay in the reconstruction because it works best in terms of light. But actually, it could be any colour. It could be luminous green. It doesn't matter. It's just the computer clay colour. And what, obviously, what we wanted to do in this case, having got to the stage where we, we then um, want to add textures, and we want to do that because, as we know, it's difficult to see a face, visualise it very well when it's just a shape. So what we had to do here, and this is where... Um, I rely on Janice to help out, is to, to reference textures from available information and to put those onto the reconstruction. And in this case, our available information was, were the portraits. So even if this wasn't Richard III, it was someone from that period of time. So we were using the same textures anyway. Uh, so this is what the, the head looks like when, when we have the 3D printout made. So that computer 3D shape is then sent off to um, a place called PDR in Cardiff, and they do a massive 3D printout of the head and shoulders life size uh, in a plastic material. Uh, and what we can do then is we can add prosthetic eyes inside, because it's hollow, into the head, the, the prosthetic eyes that you can see on the model. And then we spray it with car paint, this lovely uh, grey colour, and then I give it to Janice, and she works her magic with uh, painting the head and adding eyebrows and wigs, etc., to um, make it look as realistic as possible. Um, and obviously what was used for references were these portraits. So the skin colour and the eye colour and the hair colour were taken directly from the portrait. The wig that was used was, was a style that followed the portrait information. And in fact, Janice's mum even made a nice little outfit, as you can see, um, for him based on the uh, images in the portraits. So at a halfway stage, what we're getting is the, the bald Richard, um, and then obviously the wig and the hat and the clothing were added as well. And you can see how that compares with the portraits. Um, just as an aside, um, one of the things we can also do in forensic cases is when we have a suspected identity for human remains, we can take a photograph of the person who's thought to be the identity and superimpose um, the skull that's found with that anti-mortem image to see how well it matches up. And we sometimes do this when DNA analysis is not possible or when dental records um, are not available, or when there's mass <coughs> graves and we're trying to identify lots of people. Um, and it's quite a good way of excluding people from, because if the skull proportions and shape don't match up to the anti-mortem image of their face, then it can't be them, because it, we, it needs to fit within their head. Um, and I thought, so when I'd finished this reconstruction, and um, I don't know if you've seen the programme, but I my first initial thought was, oh, no, it really looks like him. 
Um, how am I going to justify this? And I had to go back and check multiple times the anatomical standards. And then when I'd, when I'd convinced myself that what we'd done followed all the anatomical standards and I could justify it to you, I then thought, well, I'm going to do a craniofacial superimposition with the skull and these portraits just to see what, it, what happens. And this is what I got. Now, this image here on this side is the best one. This one kind of works, but it doesn't work as well. But this one works fantastically well. I, I very rarely see a skull match a face in a forensic case as well as this. It's incredible, actually, how well this, the skull fits with this portrait, um, which was terribly convincing for me in terms of identity. Uh, and also, I think, suggests that, that there may have been um, some known information by the artist who produced this portrait, because this was produced after he died. So just because we don't have portraits of him that were done from when he was alive doesn't, doesn't mean they didn't exist then. We may just don't have them anymore. And perhaps the, it, the artist who created this was using those as reference, because this is an incredible coincidence, if it's a coincidence, for it to match up this well. Anyway, I will leave you now with um, Janice also produced a digital three-dimensional head of Richard III as well as the physical model. And this has never been seen because it was never used in the television program. So we wanted to show it to you for the first time, the digital Richard as well as the physical Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Caroline. That was a uh, breathtaking. Um, and so certainly at the end, to see the, the skull mapped out on that portrait there. Um, I certainly saw the people around the audience touching their noses and their ears. I'm one of those 10% who haven't got any uh, earlobes. Um, Caroline's happily agreed to take some questions. I'm sure some people must have some burning questions. So the first one up there. I wanted to ask, you did the, so the skull matching to the NPG portrait, which um, is, is not, I mean, we know it's kind of a copy of a copy. Mm -hmm. um, the Society of Antiquaries one, which matched less well, is probably sort of a, a first-generation copy. Yeah. Um, was it not possible to do that on, on the Windsor portrait? Uh, yes, it, it, and I could do that quite happily. I just, at the time... It was those portraits that I had available, those are the ones that I looked at. But yeah, I could do it with all of them. <laughs> I mean, I think probably the Windsor and the Society of Antiquaries are what we think are the, yeah, yeah. Is the Windsor inauthentic. One, is the Windsor one the, the kind of uh, almost slightly blurry one? Is that the one? Am I thinking of a different one? The Windsor one, well, that's the Royal Portrait. There. I mean, it's, oh, okay. the, it's okay. the origin of, the, yeah. of all the oh, okay, um, ones that yeah, we can the um, NPG one comes from. Yeah. Right. I mean, any other questions before we break? Oh, there's a gentleman right at the top. There. And also there. there. One there and then one there. Yeah. Yeah. There's quite a few, so I think uh, we'll... Uh, here and then we'll go with Hello. Um, could you tell me if it's right that Richard had no overbite? Say that again, sorry? Did Richard have no overbite for the teeth? Is that right, that they were... You mean by overbite, you mean the upper teeth more prominent than the lower teeth? No, it, they, it, it, it was... Uh, it looked... It was I, mean, I mean, everybody has a, has a slightly more prominent um, upper teeth than lower teeth, but he had edge, what's called edge-to-edge edge wear, yeah. Okay. Now, I think there was a question over, over here, and then we'll go up to here. But... Sorry. Sorry, it's that light, actually. Yeah. Just shine it up. Thank you. I just wondered if uh, the portrait showed a cleft chin and um, whether you thought there was any evidence for that. Also, um, slightly thought the nose was twisted. Did he ever have a broken nose? Okay. Um, I'll answer the, that in opposite order. The, there's no sign of a broken nose that I could see. I mean, I, 
I would like to point out that I haven't actually seen the actual skull, and so I'm limited slightly in terms of my analysis because I'm only looking at the CT data, and the CD, CT data shows shape, but I can't see detail, and, and obviously the rest of it was done from photographs. Uh, but the, I didn't see any signs of a broken nose on, on, on what I've seen. Yeah, okay. And, um, and what was the... Oh, cleft chin. Um, cleft chins are quite difficult to, to assess because they tend to be related to muscle action um, as well as shape. So I didn't assess it in terms of the anatomical assessment in terms of having a cleft chin. That doesn't necessarily rule it out, and he had a very strong chin. And often people who have very prominent chins use their chin muscles more, so they, it, that might go with uh, a strong chin and perhaps a cleft. But I didn't see any signs of it on the anatomical analysis. Yeah, we've got a microphone up here for a question over the corner there. Um, is it possible to do... Is it possible to do whole body reconstructions? <laughs> You've obviously had this one before. If so, would it be worth doing one on Richard's remains to see how prominent the sclerosis, scler, scoliosis. sclerosis is? Yes. We have done, in the past, we have done some body... Um, I wouldn't say reconstruction, but we've shown body shape in a way when it's appropriate. So, for example, I worked on an um, Olympian athlete and he had uh, much stronger muscles on one side of the body than the other from his activity. So we showed that as part of the analysis. And we've done some work before with people who had um, deformities to, to show that. So it would be possible to, to show that. I'm not sure what you would gain from reconstructing his skeleton um, other than the overall shape which you could estimate without doing that. But... Usually, I'm not really interested from the neck down, anyway. 